morrow. Good morrowist. Good morrowist on yeah. thy thee thou's. Um, yesest. Yes, yesest, indeedest. Um, because we mm. have first uh, been reading yesest. Well, thou, thou, thou not beateth around the busheth. I Please, guess, pray I'm... tell, verbicate exactly what it is that we have been reading it, thou this weekish. Oh, right. So, um, right now, when Violet put us on to Castle of Toronto, I thought that is the most interminable piece of shit I've ever read. Um, but um, that prize now goes to Awake, <laughs> Not the Dead. Which, this was suggested um... by someone on one of the Facebook sites whose name I cannot yes, remember. Yes, it was. I think it was um, Xerxes. Versus, yeah, um, who, who said he loved the castle of Oriara Grande and yes. uh, said that it's one of his favourite books and we should read this. Yep. So, so we should have taken that as a warning. We should have said, like, yeah, um, that should have set up red flags. And mm. um, one of us, um, probably me, should have said uh, no. Um, but, yeah, we right. we read uh, it. No, yes. we're supposed to do this sort of thing. Give us a synopsis, Ash. It's your week for doing a synopsis. Oh, goody. Um, yes. Right, it's a synopsis. So, um, synopsis what happens fist, is fist. Um, there's a bloke um, and he's married to Brunhilde and Brunhilde dies, so he's very sad. Um, so sad that he marries Swanhilde. Um, there is not a lot of imagination in the character names here. So, yeah, um, Brunhilde's dead. Um, he's married to Swanhilde. He's going around moping, going, oh, Brunhilde's dead. I'm very sad. I'm paraphrasing here. This isn't a cycle word for word. Um, he goes moping at a grave and a passing necromancer, because there's usually a passing necromancer, um, oh, says, um, oh, do you want me to bring her back? And he goes, oh, that'd be nice. And he says, well, it'd be a bit dangerous, you know, um, which begs the question, well, why the fuck did you ask? But we will ignore that begged question. Um, and he says, well, have a think about it. And yeah, um, I'll come back in a week. And so I think he comes back um, a week later and he says, yeah, come on, dig her up. I wanted to sort of like um, get on with my Brunhilde. And um, he says, oh, well, have a think about it for the week because it's best not to wake the dead. Best, Sorry, best to wake, not the dead. Very good use of the title appearing there. Um, so yeah, he still sticks to his guns and thinks, yeah. Um, I want the Brunhilde rather than the Swanhilde, um, digs her up and um, shags her a bit, and then she goes around drinking blood out of all the villagers because she's turned a bit vampire and then she dies, and then um, he marries someone else, and in the church a big serpent eats them and then burns the building down. Yeah, that's the one I read as well. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. And actually, the way you described that was so much better. You know what really fucked me off with this one, all right? Yeah, I want your opinion on this, but I've got to say straight away, I was listening to it on audiobook, and I kept trying to listen to it. I kept sort of like putting it back to the beginning, thinking, fucking hell, that's 15 minutes in, and I've not, not one word has digested because it's been so much... Um, what These are the opening lines to it. So, um, wilt thou forever sleep? Wilt thou never more awake, my beloved, but henceforth repose forever from thy short pilgrimage on earth? Oh, yet once again return and bring back with thee the vivifying dawn of hope to one whose existence hath, since thy departure, been obscured by the dunnest shades. Now, I know this has come from translation, um, and I know that we're a little bit unsure about the um, provenance of who wrote it, because whilst it's ascribed to um, Ludwig Teich, um, I think there's also an argument that Ernest um, Raupach um, might have been the original author. Yep, we can, we can. I think we should get into that a little bit later, actually, because there is a very interesting whole shenanigans about that that I dug up. I'm glad there's something interesting about this book. Dug up. Um, because, see what, see what um, there. Um, yeah, um, so, um, what was I saying? So, yeah, um, it starts off like that. As I was listening to it at the gym, um, I'd get 15 minutes in and think, missed every fucking word. And then I think about half an hour in, um, I heard the word vampire, and it was almost like that part in American Pie, where Willow says, "This one time at band camp, I shoved a flute up my pussy." Yes, and it was just sort of like, 
Oh, there's a vampire in this story. Right, I'll rewind it 45 fucking minutes and get back to that part of the stuff. So, yeah, it, it didn't hold my attention. No. Um, okay. uh, what I, did you think? I, as you know, and has now been certified, I have been tested. I am a dyslexic, which is great, to be perfectly honest with you. It means I always get a nine-letter word at countdown, no matter what comes out. So the the wording of it, and now I and, and you know you've known me for a very long time. Actually. You know me from from my poetry days. Um, you know how I throw old and middle English into the middle of contemporary English as well, just to play with the language. And how I do enjoy reading, particularly poetry from the Romantic period, which is full of this kind of language. Um, but I've got to agree wholeheartedly with you in that there's something about the way this is written that kept setting off the theme tune to Magic Roundabout in my head. It was almost, I tried reading it and I just, I, I might have just been on a bad week with the dyslexia because I just couldn't get my head around the, the actual structure of the lines. And when I listened to it, I had exactly the same effect as you. <laughs> I'm sitting there because I usually listen to it whilst doing something else. And I'm listening to it. And I suddenly go, I, hang on, have I actually been listening to this? It just really tuned me out in what was yeah. going on. And it was, it was almost like, it's almost like a really bad parody of something. You know, when you, you, when, you know, when you get parody movies and you get a really good one, it gets it absolutely bang on the nose and you see the way the timing comes in with the jokes and the way it takes the piss out of the, out of the actual uh, thing that you love, which is why you're watching it as a parody. Then you get those really yeah. bad parodies where it's obvious that the person hasn't actually even read the source material or seen the source material and then done yeah. a joke about it because they've heard something from someone else. And it just falls flat and it kind of just runs over the top of you because you know the source material well. That's how this felt to me. It felt like someone writing in an old English way that thought that this is how you had to write in an old English romantic way. And I know it is a translation. I, you know, and uh, I'm sure in the original German it is just as boring. But the, the, the thing is that it, it didn't, feel like other old English stuff that I've read. I actually thought the Castle of Orlanthe Biscuits was yep. um, more understandable in the way Fully that, agree, that, yeah. was, that was trying to emulate Middle English. Yeah, I mean, I think one of my, one of my many issues with it, and, and I'm not trying to piss on it just for the sake of pissing on it, I'm mm. sort of like pissing on it because... Um, it did things with a story that that I don't think writers should do. Um, and yeah, there are some arguments that 1800 vampire story is one of the earliest vampire stories that we have on record. Yeah, great. Woo, good going. Um, it's a German vampire story. Um, and we all know that um, Germans, I mean, Germans are best at porn. Um, so they're probably very good at vampires because vampires are quite erotic. But what it's not doing is it's not ticking the boxes for good storytelling for me. So that first opening chapter, first opening paragraph is all exposition. It's exposition mm. and dialogue. And the dialogue is so shit and contrived that it's dialogue that... If the wooden tops had spoken like that, people would have said, fuck off wooden tops, that's too fucking wooden. Um, it's just that wooden. The end, um, and I've got to admit, I was very, very pleased when I got to the end. Yes. Right. Um, keep in mind, for anybody who's not read this, don't, okay, because this will cause cancer of the eyeballs. Um, <laughs> um, but we've got a final paragraph where um, throughout this story, there's been this... Um, Will he bring her back to life? And then, oh, she's back to life in an undead kind of way. She's going around, she's sort of like um, drinking the villagers. Um, is he going to get fed up with it? Um, let's find out. So we get to the final paragraph that goes, um, thou hast, however, murdered the being whom thou hadst thus recalled again to existence, but it was only an appearance, for thou couldst not deprive that of life which properly had none. Thou hast... Two lost a wife and two children, but at thy years such a loss is most easily repaired. There are beauties who will gladly share thy couch and make thee again a father, but thou dreadst the reckoning of hereafter. Go, open the graves and ask the sleepers there whether that hereafter disturbs them 
in such manners would she frequently exult. Right, goes on like this until yeah. he marries again. This is in the final paragraph. He marries again. Um, yeah, so the wine streamed in abundance, the goblet circled incessantly, intemperance reached its utmost bounds, while shouts of laughter, almost resembling madness, burst from the numerous train belonging to the unknown. At length, Walter, heated with wine and love, conducted his bride into the nuptial chamber, but, oh, horror, scarcely had he clasped her in his arms, ere she transformed herself into a monstrous serpent, which, entwining him in its horrid folds, crushed him to death. Flames crackled on every side of the apartment. In a few minutes, after the whole castle was enveloped in a blaze that consumed it entirely, while as the walls fell in with a tremendous crash, a voice exclaimed aloud, wake not the dead. What the actual fuck? Well, translation <laughs> is uh, basically uh, when he, he, so he, let's go through, he had Bruhilda, then he had Swanhilda, yeah. then he got back new Bruhilda, right? Uh, or Bruhilda 2.0, and then, Fucked off Swanhilda, right? And she was not happy about that because he let Bruhilda eat the kids. You know, and that's, you know, not a great... I mean, granted, she should not have left without the kids. That shows it's not a modern tale. But he let her eat the kids. So she's not happy. And then he she ki he kills new Bru, Hilda, uh, under the curse that if he ever thinks of her ever again, that'd be the end of him. And then some comes forth... New Brew Hilda, I think that's actually her name or something like that. New Hilda comes forward, right? And then looking just like Brew Hilda, exactly the same. Um, and he thinks about her just before he thought, Oh, look at that. I'm just about to have my way with this sort who looks just like my first missus. And at which point she turns into a snake because he's thought of Brew Hilda again. It's a rather contrived story, I will admit. Um, and yeah, um. And it makes zero fucking sense. I mean, Just, even if we've got a curse yeah. like that, you know, a curse with, oh, well, you'll regret it. And the curse yeah. is she turns into a snake and sets fire to a church. Yeah, it, that, it, it really. And not only that, is they're having it on in the church as well, aren't they? Yeah. It, I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't think I've ever actually seen that before. I know that consummation of marriage is all to do with the actual binding of the contracts and stuff something to do with signing the registrar in a different type of ink. But the, 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 whole, the whole idea that we're going to get married and they've got a chamber out the back that they can go and do the consummation in instantly, it's a bit Dutch, isn't it? Um, I would have said it's very Catholic. It's as though we've sort of like got the priests sort of like, oh, do you know, I'll tell you what, in between choir practice, um, you, boy, um, yeah, you with the big ears, because... Uh, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, it does lead us, though, to the whole idea that um, this would definitely benefit from a feminist reading um, because we've got men not just in power, but the commodification of women and the way women are used throughout this story is um, is ridiculous, really. Yes. Yeah, but I'm going to put a counterpoint on that um, oh. and say that it actually is a tale about the absolute, complete and utter stupidity of men. Because he doesn't even think something odd is going on until the entire fucking village is dead. Everyone, kids, women, met the lot of them, gone, dead, drowned, absolutely out of it. And at that point he goes, hmm, something odd's going on here. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> right there. Um, it is about the stupidity of men. Um, but the whole way that women are just, as I say, commodified and sort of like, um, oh, I've got a wife, she's brilliant, really, really like her. Oh, she's dead, I want her back. Um, in the meantime, I'll get another wife. Um, and, yeah, I'll argue with this passing necromancer bloke um, trying to get him to sort of like dig her up. It's very, very... Very limited in the way it represents the feminine. It's very, it's, 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 I'm, I'm going to put my neck on the line and say it's just shit. It's really poorly yeah. done for that. Um, again, it's like we've read a few of them that do this where, where you see the patriarchy of that, of that time coming through within that middle class to gentry class of people. There's, there's a lot of it coming through, but you get a lot more fight coming back. There's no fight in the women in this at all. They are 
completely. The only one that's got any fight is the one that's come back from the dead, who's going around eating people and using her wily vampire powers. Um, yeah. That, you know, that's the only thing that you can, you can kind of sort of like level at it. But I think it's, it's one of those, look, first of all, little bits of credit, the vampire uh, tropes that it, seem to develop uh which are still in play today were quite good about the sunlight stabbing through the heart which usually would kill most things to be perfectly honest with you not just from the stand, you know that uh yeah drinking of the blood um you know there's a few tropes that have kind of stood the test of time out of it but like you say there's so many bits of it that it's almost like it really it's it's almost like someone telling a story that's never met anyone it, there's yeah. no inf- information of people at all in it and as a consequence you get this like what's that one that we read where it was the oh um man with the nose wasn't it i think yeah where it was just it was it was like a the the, the 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 female writer was writing the women characters pretending as if it was a man writing women characters and that's why they came across so thin and, and veiled because that's what a lot of male writers did particularly back then and still do now to be fair um and it's it it comes across like that even for the male characters there's no depth in any of the characters whatsoever even the necromancer is so two-dimensional you know yeah and there's no or, or, there's no specific is there actual character development in it and we just couldn't understand a bloody word of it so therefore it didn't come across <laughs> um no again one of the things that it was lacking for me as well um and and i'm not trying to piss on this from a great height and just be mean-spirited about it. Um, I like trying to get in touch with all the different stories that we read, and I will make a concentrated effort. Yes. But there didn't seem to be any decent description in here either. There was nothing that placed me into the story, so I was there thinking, oh, yeah, this is fascinating, or well-described, or, oh, yeah, I can really visualise that. It seemed to be exposition, 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 um, all the way through um, for no purpose. It was like... It yeah. was like a drunk at a party telling me a story. Um, and all that you think whilst that's happening is, can I punch the fucker? Um, will he sort of like not remember this next time I see him? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of I think I've, I just put my finger on something there and I can't remember the name of it. But it's something to do with the romantic, because this is this is a romantic period. And, and this goes back to why there's um, a thing about its providence in that uh, Ludwig was a renowned writer from the romantic period and he actually wrote a story called the bride in the grave yes in about the 1800s about 1800 and this one yep. apparently is about 1923 when this one got published in it in an anthology 1823 Eight, sorry, um, 1823 so my like I say my brain's all over the bloody place today so 1823 as the translation when the translation, oh, that's when the translation was, was, was it well the, yeah. the the book of anthology that it came out from that it came from apparently was miss indexed because right. it was it was it was indexed as being from the as a romantic story and because it was about a bride in a grave and he was a, notor- a, 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 a notorious notorious he was a, a noted uh, romantic writer of the time it was attributed to him and it was actually then years later stated it was somebody else but that is still a bit washy there's no absolute hard evidence of that going on but it's the romantic thing that i want to focus on there and i've been waffling there trying my hardest to remember the word it's basically something that the romantic poets did a lot of where they they had a reverence for the natural world that's debating that's basically what i think this guy was doing over his wife's grave and the necromancer came around and said well you just shut up a little bit you'll wake the dead that's you know that's where I think it comes from actually. But the um, I will come back. Deliloquizing. Oh, the splendid no. Oh. Deliloquizing. No 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 it's not that it's oh. about the the splendor of things. Ah, oh, it will come to me. I will remember it. I will remember it. But it's it's the it's where they they had an absolute awe for everything. Everything was so powerful. Even when it was a negative, it still had this splendor. And um, uh, Mary Shelley does it. In Frankenstein a lot but that has this wonderful kind of like when it talks about the hillsides they have this reverence for the power of nature and um and I can't for the life of me remember what the word is but that's what this story doesn't have it lacks all the emotional integrity of the romantics are you saying that with the belief that horror needs emotional 
impact, emotional connection? Partly, yes, because I think any story really requires an emotional connection to be able to really get inside, particularly horror. And humour does the same thing as well, I think. You've got to get inside the emotional side of things. But also, it's from the romantic period and it uses the language of the romantics and it doesn't have this awe about it. When you, when you read Frankenstein, when even when you read, read The Castle of Oreo, the... Um, the language, however convoluted it got in the middle and was really confusing, the descriptions were magnificent. And you got this, this awe of the place. And that's why it becomes a gothic, you know, a proto-gothic novel, because you had the stone dripping with history and moving paintings. And however absurd it was, you still had this splendor that was going on. And in this, it didn't feel like you were anywhere. It just felt like a drunk in the corner of a pub trying to do Shakespeare. It didn't have any of that magnificence about it. Yeah, I absolutely fully agree. It's, well, yeah, it was an uncomfortable read. And when ideas did occur and the ideas sort of like seemed, oh, that's a good idea. I can see that one being explored. It wasn't fully explored. It wasn't fully utilised. Yes. Um, or it yes. wasn't fully explained. And yeah, perhaps this is because I'm a little bit on the thick side and I need things sort of like spelling out to me and explaining so that I can sort of like have a, here's your paint by numbers pictures of what was going on there, Ashley. Um, and I can go, oh, right, yeah, so yeah, cursing, things like that. But Maybe, but I, I don't totally buy into that because I think, I think there are sometimes things that you can read where you don't have to understand it to enjoy it. Because I think poetry is like that a lot, and especially when you sort of like going back to like the Romantic period poetry, where you sort of sit there and you go, I have no idea what that was about, but it sounded amazing. You know, the words have a life of their own. They kind of, they, they just sort of drip. And we were saying yeah. this as well, weren't we, about even though Dickens, when you sort of, you know, when you get into that area, but when you, when you talk about Dickens and uh, the signal man, even though all the characters are underdeveloped, the descriptions that he wrote still had that awe about them. They still had that majesty that you expect from a Dickens. So you could yeah. still enjoy the descriptions, even though the characters were rubbish and all that kind of stuff. There was something to hold on to. Here, to me, the only thing for, that you could really get out of it was there were some interesting ideas that developed on the vampire theme and the necromancer giving his warning out and be careful what you wish for before the monkey's paw one assumes it's kind of like the same be careful what you wish for style story um, as a proto for that but it just doesn't have anything it didn't have anything in it for me that drew me into it like you said it's not like oh my god the way that they've just phrased it when you actually sort of look into it and all it meant was Oh, I walked down the road on a Monday, but it was written in that kind of like, oh, you know, wonderful purple language. Um, and it doesn't it's, it's all it all sounds like a purple language, but it has no substance whatsoever. It's like looking at a beautiful, gorgeous chocolate cake that has no flavor when you bite into it. Yeah, it was it was definitely that it was just. It just left me so dull. And so flat. Um, there were characters, I mean, you've got stuff like the vampire, a resurrected vampire, who should be interesting. Yes. Um, you've got a man who's resurrected a vampire, well, resurrected his wife because he loved her so much, um, or loved her so much in his particularly perverse way, where love just happens to be, do you know what, I'll go for the Broomhilda rather than the Swanhilda this week. Um, so, yeah, you've got a character like that who could have been interesting. It's, it sort of like played him a little bit more to show this bigotry and this obsession um, with women who've got Hilda as a middle name. Um, and you've got a necromancer who should have been an interesting character. And none of these were interesting. It yeah. just left me so fucking frustrated. Yeah. Um, who totally. do you think he was trying to terrify? Did I think what? Sorry. Who do you think he was trying to terrify? Because one of the things that we try and do is what were yeah, he yeah. thinking? So yeah, where what was, was he coming thinking? in? Um, I yeah. think he was. I I I do think that there's an attempt at um, trying to, in a very Catholic way, 
trying to it's a bit like it's a bit like twilight in that way it's a tale of abstinence as rather than being a you know and a tale of the, the, a, a cautionary tale of greed you know one of the papers that i was actually reading compared it um, quite heavily to twilight what's um, um, <laughs> um sorry twilight fans um it was sort of like showing how um the characters um did have this relationship aside from the fact that um your main female character in twilight is um mortal and not a vampire and this one is a vampire and not mortal um aside from that they bore up quite well there was like quite a lot of strong similarities between them but again twilight doesn't actually do a lot for me and i suppose that's one of the things where i should be careful with my criticism i mean xerxes when he's suggested this one. Um, he didn't suggest it because he thought, this has got to sort of like stick a bug up Ashley's ass. Um, he suggested <laughs> it because he thinks it's, Mine. I hope that's, don't worry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he suggested it because he thinks this is a horrifying story. Um, just like no. you and I will piss on Twilight. And there are lots of people out there who sort of like think Twilight is the zenith of good vampire writing. Yeah, but the, 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 other, the other thing about it as well, and I think, again, this is where one of those ideas um, uh, blends with Twilight actually quite well is that this story, and this is why I, I'm going back to it, this story is framed as a romance it's it's undying love, it's you know it's, it's you know first love, it's willing to do anything for your love which is all those themes go on within Twilight as well and they're not as powerful in Dracula though they are there in Dracula, the idea of you know, renouncing death in order to find the reincarnation of your love. You know, it's, this is a very big vampire theme that is definitely being pushed in this story. So I think if, if you buy into it, I think if it's one of those things that catches you in the right frame of mind and you, and you buy into the romance of the language, like I say, I understand the romance of the language being used. But for me, it was missing that that fundamental point of the of, of that. But that's why people like like Twilight, don't they? They don't read Twilight to be scared. They tweet, they read Twilight for the love story, you know, and they and without seeing how problematic it can be, because they yeah. are invested in the romance of the story rather than seeing it uh, in an objective light. Which is well, what I think that's how we like should read anything. That, yeah, that's how we should read any romance story. Mm. It shouldn't be about, um, oh, but it's problematic. Who gives a fuck whether it's problematic or not? Because is that's, it romantic? Yeah, romance, yeah. yeah. Romance um, is way outside that. So let's take it away from being a horror frightening type thing and go for the romance side of things that's going on here. Because that is, to me, is where it's kind of being, it's being framed as a romance gone wrong, I think. Right. Or is it an attempt at a cross genre that hasn't worked? Um, if we go for a romance, um, we've sort of like got the characters who uh, have been brought together before the start of the story. They've been separated at the start of the story. Um, he, um, is it Walter? I think it is, isn't it? Um, yes. He wants to bring them back together. Um, and the necromancer says, well, I'll have a think about it, and wants to and wants to, then brings them back together. And even though they're back together, they're still not 100% happy because she's going out sucking off the village, not in that way. And um... You see, it could almost be a Richard Curtis when you describe it like that. Which Richard Curtis does one of them go around sucking off an entire village? Bob, actually, I think. Watch that again. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I suppose there are there are romantic elements in there, and I suppose if I was going to classify this story rather than putting it under horror or romance, I would put it under literature, um, but not as a compliment. I would put it under literature just because I don't know what the fuck's happening there. Stick it under literature, you know. If it's a story that scared me, oh, that's horror. Story that you can have a wank to, that's erotica. Story where you go, oh, ain't that nice, that's romance. Yeah, story where you're there thinking, what the actual fuck? Yeah. Literature. Literature. Classic, yeah. <laughs> classic literature. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> story where you're thinking, Jesus, where the fuck did that? In that case, modern literature, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
and the and 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 if it's if the if the worm came out of the bride right at the beginning of the story, that'll be postmodernistic literature. Pretty much, yes. Yeah. yeah. Now it's it's. I mean, to be to be fair to it, um. I did not find it frustrating and I did not get angry at it. And I think that's why I am declaring this one to be just shit because it actually left me cold. Whereas the, the castle of, um, of, uh, Oh God, I can never remember the name. I was trying to think of another O then the castle of O. Um, Orgasmo. Orgasmo. The castle of Orgasmo. <laughs> There's a book waiting to be written. Um <laughs> We got caught under his giant helmet. Now the um, <laughs> that annoyed me at times because it wasn't fulfilling things in the right way for me in, in the way you know the way you fulfill a story. But at least it triggered emotions within me about being annoyed by it and understanding and being quite delighted by certain uh, elements that were oh my god this is like the first time we're reading this and going well there's not many novels before this and he's conjured it completely out of his imagination and. You get all of that. In all the ones that we've read, even the ones that we've considered to be rubbish, we have still managed to go into it and find those things. Like I said, this is the first one that we have done where I just couldn't get my head into the into the writing of it. And I struggled to listen to it, not because I found it difficult, but because it just, just bored the hell out of me, I think. I just couldn't. There was nothing grabbing me at all. Like you say, the word vampire turns up, and it is almost like someone just going... I got a huge cock in the middle of fucking McDonald's. You know, it's just, it's it's a thing that you go, yeah. what? Uh, what happened there? You know, pulls you into it. Like I say, is it the translation that has caused that? Is this a lost in translation that we're dealing with in this story? And, um, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, go on. Sorry, mate. Go on. I was going to say, and the people that really love this story, do they actually know it in the original German? Strong possibility, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, it's a strong possibility that it could be lost in translation. It could be, um, it could be that I'm out of step with this. Um, it could be that we're out of step with this, and awesome. we're sort of like, um, yeah, we are there thinking. No horror um, is the epitome of horror. Is Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger, and everything after that is sort of like, um, yeah, just an attempt at Voorhees and Krueger. Um, yeah, it it had a it had too many weaknesses for my um, delicate palette um which is why i've got a real fucking treat for you for what we're reading next week if we're okay well let's let's just let's just round up on this one for a second in that i think we can safely say that uh we didn't enjoy reading it sorry uh i know you you asked us to, but i'm sorry we didn't enjoy reading it um it does have some interesting ideas but they were felt underdeveloped and if you if you have read this and you get a lot out of it great um, it's not like one of those ones where I'm going to sit there and say, uh, well, it's even like Twilight, isn't it? I don't, I don't mock people for liking Twilight unless it's genuinely funny. Um, and Dan Brown, there's a lot of people like Dan Brown and I can't stand his writing. So it's, it's got I a lot of things to do. Brown. Hey? I love Dan Brown. Yeah, mate. So you love yeah. Dan Brown and I love the end of Dan Brown chapters. That's about the only thing I like about his, the end, he ends chapters better than anyone else does. Um, what I will say about this one is, um, if there's anybody who's read it and who thinks, ah, oh, you pair of wankers, you've completely missed the mark on this, there's a comment section underneath. Yeah, Tell yeah, us which please. parts we missed. Tell me which parts to go back to and which parts to reread and, yeah, in what sort of light. And I will happily take another shot at things because I'm always eager to learn things. Absolutely. I'm not School always very really good at it. School us. Yeah, absolutely yes. school us on it. Because I mean, and you've seen us do it. We are, we do take on the ideas. You have seen every single person here discuss things. And actually, when we've had opposite ideas, we've both gone, actually, no, you got a point and you go back and revisit yeah. it. So this one, I think we need schooling on. So please tell us in the comments below exactly where we have gone wrong with this. And, yes, and, please. and if, the, if the answer is you picked it up and read it in the first place, we'd agree with you. But... <laughs> We don't want that. We want somebody who really loves this to tell us why we're idiots and for, for the way that we've talked about it. Because somebody who really loves it will have got to this point in the video, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, Back tell me more about how shit my favourite story is, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, so what have we got? And then I'm going to tell you some exciting news that we've got to figure something out for. Right. What have we got for next week? What have we got for next week? Right. Um, right. Do you like dick? 
it, it, it has been thrown at me that I might do. Um, do you like Philip K. Dick? Oh, I love Philip K. Dick. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. Philip K. Dick. Thank you, Matt Berry. The eyes have it. Philip K. Dick. Um, yeah, it's one of his short stories. It, um, I think it was either last year or the year before when it entered the um, public domain. Um, you can find audio copies of it on YouTube. And it's... Um, I like it. I actually like this story. I like I like Philip K. Dick. So, yeah. Yes. So, okay. exciting news. Exciting news is... Um, um, I've got to look up his name now. Because uh, the trouble is, I only in my head he's Martin Platt from Coronation Street, <laughs> right? And I know this is going to sound a bit strange. His name is Sean. Is Wilson. this like on extras where he keeps calling him Barry from East End? Yes, it's very much <laughs> like that. I had the same problem when I met the guy that played Arthur Dent in um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I kept calling him Arthur. And, the, and he, uh, <laughs> one of the other cars went, you know, he has got a real name. And I just went, I don't care. He's Arthur Dent as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, Sean Wilson is his name. Uh, he played Martin Platt in Coronation Street. He is a master cheesemaker now. He makes the most Still incredible the cheeses. Yeah, he, he, that's why he left Coronation Street to, st to start a farm. where he So he farms the other thing and he makes the most incredible cheeses. Anyway, I got talking to him. Because I met him at the um, Christmas markets in Manchester. He was there selling his cheese. And that's why I know it's so nice because he bought some of it. Um, anyway, so we got chatting away. It turns out he's actually a very, very good, very funny poet. You would love the stuff that he writes. It's very, very good. Um, right. not, much of a, not much of a reader of um, old Victorian weird tales and Edwardian weird tales, but has agreed to come on the show. We give him a, a story to read. And he will come on and comment on it, even though it's not his shtick, which I think is brilliant to see what his I... thoughts would be about a, an old story. I can't wait. OK, so we need to select yeah. a story. Nothing too difficult because, you know, it's, it's not it's not his his genre. So something a bit on the easier side of things in order to get get into from a ghost story point of view. So I'm going to have a look. I'm going to I'm going to say he's a bit of a more man, man. I'm going to show this book as well. Look at this. I got this for Christmas. Oh, nice. Yeah. So yeah. We've, we, and we've only read one out of the entire book. Um, Cole, yeah. have a look at um, have a look at the one that I've suggested for next week. Um, oh, well, the eyes have it. Yeah. I tell you what, if, if I will have a chat with him and I will see if he can make next week, I will tell him to read that. Um, so we may have we may have Sean Wilson, a.k.a. Martin Platt, Master Cheesemaker. It's an incredibly short, short story, this one. Um, and yeah, that would be awesome. So well, yeah, I'll, um, I'll send it to him yeah. and ask him if he'll turn up next week for that one. How's that? Perfect. Brilliant. All right. Well, Thank as always. Mate. As always, this has been fantastic. It's lovely to see you yeah. again, Ash. Lovely to see you at Likewise. home. Do please school us if you've made it this far. Please tell us why we were wrong. Yes, we almost certainly are. The story's lasted longer than either of us. So, yeah, um, yeah. We, we, we know we're in the wrong. Yeah. Thank you, guys. See you in a bit. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.